This is a house where no one should live. Enter at your own risk. Yes, reports of my death have been greatly exaggerated. I am not abandoning the channel, I am still here. Even though I am working with IGN, it's great to be with them, and it certainly is improving my reach, and certainly the views I'm getting on that channel are kind of the views I hoped I would get whenever I started this channel. So at least it shows that I'm on the right track, or I was back in 2013. Anyway, the next gen has become the now gen, and with Sony kicking off with some exclusive PS5 titles, Microsoft looked onwards to 2021 to get its exclusive titles into our hands. Last week, Bloober Games managed to be the first now generation Xbox exclusive with the medium. Being available on the Series X, the S and PC, I would thought it would be good to cover after my short hiatus on my channel. So, is this going to silence the critics with a horrific showcase or is evil afoot? Let's cut through that PR and dig in. Shut up. Now, the game itself is firmly in the Silent Hill camp of horror. Slow-paced, psychological tension building, puzzle-based elements, and largely a passive action style throughout. Its main hook is the dual worlds our protagonist has to exist within, or can exist within. Shifting planes with a haste Kane would be envious of. It offers duality to puzzles and progression not unlike that seminal title. It is in no way a like Soul Reaver, aside the need for you to always think on this dual plane approach, but this shift in visual style and gameplay is welcome and does offer an original take on the genre. That said, I do not think it has been realised to a level of complexity or variety I had hoped for. The same can be said for the entire art and animation, with their previous Blade Runner meets Snatcher-esque Observer hitting a far more stylized presentation that added a great deal to that game and themes, although it has got that technoir look for Blade Runner to lean back on. The premise here is excellent, with a sombre opening that builds atmosphere with panache. Sadly though, it never maintains that momentum. I would like to see more done with this spiritual and physical meld that could have delivered some unique sequences. This is not to say the game is bad, simply that it rarely had any genuine surprises or intensity such as I got from The Observer and that late great Rutger Hauer's performance. It also has too many horror tropes across the game with some genuine odd character blips. Why is someone that talks to the dead so frightened of cats, car horns and butterflies? I mean, they used to collect them. Ow! Shit! What is that? But from a pure story and premise level, it really reminded me of the excellent Peter Jackson and Michael J. Fox film, The Frighteners. An absolute quality movie, and that blend between the afterlife and the now life, as in here you really are helping to deliver peace to those spirits still at unrest. One thing this gameplay hook does provide though is a chance to push the visuals and hardware we now have. Now I will largely focus my testing here on the Series X and my overclocked RTX 2070 which is for all intents and purposes a 2070 Super like spec card. Paired with an overclocked Zen 2700, an 8 core 16 thread CPU, overclocked here at 3.8 gigahertz and 16 gigabytes of RAM, this is a well specced machine to battle the might of the Series X. Maybe not beat it, maybe. Now one area I have seen on reviews for this game is due to its split worlds, the fast SSD and increased velocity API is vital for it to exist and is the reason it is next gen only. Now this is obviously incorrect as it's not a limitation here at all. Something I will confirm here by all my PC tests being used with a bog standard 7200 RPM hard drive. As noted, Soul Reaver was a pioneer on streaming technology back in the 90s on a CD-powered PS1 with dual worlds. Here the team have utilised the power of the GPU and the RAM footprint to achieve their aims. Something the Series S really highlights with its near 40% RAM reduction being a major impact on resolution and effects. It's also backed up by the fact that the PC doesn't even have the Velocity API architecture just yet in DirectX. In standard single viewport mode, the Series X renders at or around 2560 by 1440p. It certainly hits that, but it uses dynamic resolution scaling and then TAA to create a sharp image that reconstructs back to 4K via Unreal Engine 4's temporal accumulation post-processing solution. Now, from all my counts, it never achieves a true 4K, but Unreal TAA does deliver great results. 
Now the S however only hits 1080p at best, but once two render ports exist in RAM along with the relevant textures, the alphas, the lighting and shadow maps, they can both take a hit. With the lowest point on the Series X now dropping to 1344 by 756 and then on the Series S it can go as low as 1152 by 648 and this is always at a maximum of 30 FPS on both. In addition, the Series S has no ray trace reflections or ambient shadows, which the X does at certain points, while well, reflections only. Specifically, this game shows the Series S big Achilles heel and cost cutting, that lack of RAM. And I'm sure bandwidth at times also. I'm getting vibes of the PS4 Pro, as I mentioned all that time ago. Now one swallow does not a summer make, and the PC version is equally telling on the demands of the game. And they are much higher than you may realise. My RAM packed 2070 overclocked again is also not enough to meaningfully break free of that 30fps limit with any true gusto at 1440p. It can still fall below 30 in fact, and as such can feel worse at times. Once dual renders pop up, then the resolution needs to be dropped as per consoles, otherwise it hits and drops into the teens. Now even with the split pools of RAM, they deliver more than on the S, and as such we can hold above the X at times on pixel counts, but sadly performance is the limiting factor here and you would not want to. Being an NVIDIA sponsored title, it does support DLSS and this is actually needed to get decent performance on the title. But with DLS driven 1440p target, it renders the game at a much lower resolution but it uses its dedicated tensor cores to create the missing data and reconstruct it back to that 1440p target. And generally results here are excellent with it looking sharp and close to that Unreal Engine 4's TAA 1440 version at points, which is what both consoles and AMD cards are stuck with. It does not always work though with shimmer on thin areas being more pronounced. The ray trace reflections are much lower resolution than a native 1440 and it also generally halves the SSR effects and shadows as you can see here, but Fidelity FX is also present and it can be enabled on non-AMD cards which actually holds up pretty well and can get more from less. It's not as good as the DLSS solution, but like I say, there are points where it breaks down. And that seems to come largely from the fact that the team have used effects without any thought about where in the game they are, what hardware they're going to run on. Side ray tracing, you can see it's on here on PC on the floor, and then we flip to the dual screen, it gets turned off. And that's what ray tracing on does on PC, which is the same as the Series X. It just turns off that ray tracing. When you put it on Ultra, it forces it on, but performance is horrible at that point in dual mode, so I wouldn't recommend it. You can see it's already sub-30 here using 1440p base upscale back up to 4K. So I wouldn't choose that as an option, but without that it generally looks identical to the high settings on PC There really isn't a great deal in it the ray tracing options like I say can add a great deal and certainly the uh, Transparent ray trace reflections are pretty good when they appear But they are very rare and few and far between the biggest reason that ray tracing is used is, is for opaque reflections in mirrors and that happens on the Series X when it's required but obviously the Series S doesn't have it. But it does show the fact that some of these effects are a little more than marketing spiel because you don't really need it. The Series S doesn't have ray tracing and at the beginning section I showed earlier you can see no reflection at all in that mirror, it's just a cube map. But later in the title you need to see reflections due to the gameplay and the style of jumping between worlds and guess what? They appear perfectly on the Series S, and they're just using planar reflections. And looking at the quality, I'd be amazed to say that the Series X isn't using planar reflections. And because of the fact that generally when you see transparent or ray trace reflects in the title, or when ray trace and reflections should be turned on on the Series X, they're not. So I'm not even fully convinced that the Series X is actually using ray tracing due to the quality of the reflections, the points in which they turn up, and the quality they are compared to the... Uh, NVIDIA ones here, they look closer to those planar reflections that are on the Series S than they do with the ray trace ones that are on the PC. So my suspicion is that they are using ray tracing just when they can in limited sections and where they can't they revert back. Certainly I can't see any evidence of ray trace ambient occlusion or shadows but you can certainly see here on the reflective door surfaces and the diffused back of the cabinet there her feet that looks like ray trace reflections to me. So it's certainly using them but it's very very sparingly and it doesn't always look to be a performance related sacrifice.
Jack taught me to accept my condition. From a pure material and object perspective, that fixed camera Resident Evil style works wonders to show off some of the beautiful assets, the marble, the stone, the floor, the character models at times can be very, very good. And obviously we've come a long way from those pre-rendered backdrops now looking like this with ray tracing. But generally, because it's a story-driven title and it is a small team, the animation does let it down. Both the character animation in traversing the world or just climbing over objects can be a little wooden and it can judder and it can feel inconsistent. And then a story-centric title like this needs to tell the story in those cutscenes. And even though the motion capture movement is quite good, it, what lets it down is the wooden, stiff movement. No lip sync into the words, the hands float around, trip through tables, and they don't connect between what is being said and what is trying to be delivered on a physical presence. And that is a shame, because it is a small team and they've done an exceptional job, but it does show how difficult animation is and how much we take it for granted in these bigger titles. Like I say, it's just an acceptance of what the quality of the title is. It isn't a big team, it is a small team, and they've done an exceptionally good job. And I think some of that is down to the fact that it's been pushed forward by Microsoft as their first exclusive. Therefore, it's probably being compared to other teams, which they aren't really on that level of. No offence intended for that. And that can also come from performance, as it's not that impressive. 30 FPS is generally fine in this mode, 1440p DLSS, and it's actually needed for my PC here. But even with it on at that 1440p target, it can fall below that for prolonged periods of time. On the console, the Series S stutters and skips with pacing issues, but some sections can hammer it harder into the low 20s. But not being an action title, it never really intrudes that much, but you can certainly feel it when you're playing the game. Now, again, because it's a slow-paced title, it doesn't have loads of fast input times, you don't really battle anything, and it's generally a horrific puzzle-based title. It doesn't feel bad, but it does come across juddery and stuttery at points, and that is a shame. And that carries over to the Series X version as well. It can skip and jump up and down between 33, 16 milliseconds and 50 milliseconds, and that can make the point where it does feel a little inconsistent. Generally, performance does need a lot of work. Memory allocation is certainly a big issue for the team because that's one of the biggest hits on the resolution because they're running out of RAM. And again, that points to the fact that they don't have that ability to utilize the SSD to mitigate that issues in RAM. And that's why it's so demanding on all hardware. The Series S can only maximize at 1080p, and because of that lack of RAM, the BVH grid and the ray tracing options are not really an option, so they're disabled. And on the Series X, that means that the ray tracing options are sacrificed or dynamically allocated at certain points, and they don't hit the ultra levels of PC. So it mixes them up between screen space reflections at points. So you can see the reason why the team have handpicked certain points to turn it on, because it adds impact to the visuals, and then turn it off because it has too much of an effect on the performance. And even with DLSS, it doesn't save the PC version. So by and large, there are some cutbacks which are quite obvious. You can see the Series X has no ray tracing, so this mirror is just completely pointless, and it looks like a bland, flat texture with just a cube map wrapped into it, or even just a texture over the top. It might not even be a cube map. And then on the Series X, it's a lower resolution, half resolution reflections on the ray trace options here compared to the same setting on the PC, which is basically ray tracing on. If you force the higher version on ray tracing on the PC on, it basically forces ray tracing in the dual mode. It adds in ambient ray trace shadows, and they're just very, very expensive for a very small amount of impact of visual quality. So I can see why they were turned off. It's an obvious sacrifice to performance. And by and large, this is a 30 FPS title on every piece of hardware you try to run it on. Even if you go to 1080p, it will drop below 60 more often than it will be above it. Now, I did go back and retest this with the latest patch this week, and it does improve some of the areas overall in the dual render ports, but generally the ray tracing elements, the order independent transparencies, they still have the same high impact, and they still need to refine some of those effects. Here you can see on my 2070 overclocked, it can drop into 40 millisecond frame times just looking at this cobweb because it's having that order independent transparency cost in terms of the rendering rate. So these are the areas they need to refine because what you get is an inconsistent game that can vary wildly from one frame to the next or one scene to the next. 
text, and that is a very unenjoyable element. Also, it can have a few texture flickering and bloom issues and general just rendering issues across all versions, and the PC version crashed far more often than I would like, uh, back to the desktop, and then one of the times it actually locked me out of my save, so I couldn't get back into the game because it never loaded the game UI at the front. It was out of focus and had to, in the end, reset the game just to get my cloud save to come back and carry on playing, which is a frustrating process for a game of this caliber and you know a premier xbox title they should have worked on that a little better overall the usage of memory allocation is one of the biggest issues like i say you can see here that one gigabyte is being sucked away once you turn on ray tracing and those dual render elements can also do the same thing because the dual render elements are actually sometimes they're the same render viewport and they're just reskinned and retextured elements so that saves a little bit of cost and other times they are a genuine split screen in terms of they're re-rendering two separate viewports from both sides of that perspective two different camera angles and therefore they've got to retransform everything and that means that cost is quite high and that's the only area where it would be possible on next generation consoles but I would probably suspect that this could run on the Xbox One X only due to that large allocation of RAM the size of the GPU and the overall performance I'm pretty confident that it would run on that machine and in fact the PC test proves that it can certainly run on a standard hard drive. It's an enjoyable game but performance and overall presentation can let it down at certain points but if it was an action title it's generally a very passive title and that means it gets away with this performance by and large because you don't feel it as much as you are just watching this interactive story. Had it been a far more interactive and you know a standard action horror title, then I would have given it a far more scathing result because it can't really get away with the performance it's got on any format because it's just too inconsistent. They certainly need to fix the issues, but it gets away with most of them because it's almost an interactive story. Anyway, that's it for now, and I hope you enjoyed my return to the channel and this deep dive look at the medium on Xbox and PC. If you do like this, remember to subscribe, share, and obviously support the channel by leaving, leaving your comments below. And do not worry, I will get back to a more consistent rotation now of videos on this channel and on IGN so that you get the best of both worlds. Please tell your friends that I'm still around. I'll catch you on the next one.